Hi, I'm Jared Dillian of the Daily Dirt Nap. I'm talking with Peter Atwater today of Financial Insights. And we're going to be talking about market sentiment, something that uh, we spend a lot of time talking about. Um, there's uh, so much to talk about today, with, especially with China, um, crypto, uh, a lot of crazy stuff going on out there. Um, it's funny because just this morning before the interview, um, Peter highlighted something I had written in one of my newsletters about the movie Crazy Rich Asians which I think came out in 2018, 17, 18, uh, and how that was the biggest sentiment top of all time. And it, it really is. So let's talk about what's going on in China with Evergrande. I know you had some thoughts on that in your recent note. Yeah, I, it's been fascinating to watch the parallels, honestly, between our response to COVID in China and our response to Evergrande in Evergrande in China. Um, you know, in both cases, everyone has quickly concluded the, the problem is contained. And, you know, while that may or may not be the case, I guess we'll, you know, we'll soon see. Um, we, we've jumped to a conclusion that I think is, you know, potentially perilous. So, you know, when I've been looking at China, um, you know, the thing that stands out to me about Evergrande is that, if you go back 10 or 15 years ago, you had reports on 60 Minutes about the ghost cities in China. They built all this infrastructure. They built all the cities. China had a different model of capitalism. They had this state-directed investment. Uh, it's not free market capitalism. And we were watching this for years, and it seemed to be working. And we said, maybe this economic model works better. Maybe they have it figured out. And what we're seeing with Evergrande is the product of 10 to 15 years of malinvestment that's finally coming home to roost. And, you know, I look at this and I think that, you know, thinking back to the financial crisis, I mean, you talked about the parallels between like Lehman and Bear and stuff like that. But this is this is something before Bear. I mean, this is like 2005. I mean, we're just getting the first waves of this. Yeah, and it's the same mindset. You know, when when the subprime crisis hit, everybody had the same response. It's it's contained. It's insignificant. You know, there won't be any, you know, fallout from it. And and I think what people forget is not, you know, the size of the specific issue, but the sentiment reflected within it. You know, the, the reason that subprime mattered wasn't that it was enormous, but that it was ridiculous behavior. And, you know, the, the question to me with, with Evergrande is, not its absolute size, which is, you know, admittedly enormous, but what it says about sentiment, you know, particularly to your point, that it's gone on as long as it has. You know, we, we've denied that there was that there have been issues for for, you know, years. I mean, but the thing with the thing with a top down command economy is that they have the ability to paper over losses uh, and sort of kick the can for a really long period of time. So, I mean, you know, it took it took the Soviet Union 40 plus years to collapse. You know, I mean, they just it, it, so they have the ability to paper over it, which is why it's taken this long. Um, I the the price action, you know, I, I expected um, more of a correction on the Evergrande news. I expected a 10 percent correction, something on order of what would have happened in 2015. Um, but that's that's not what happened. We got about a four and a half percent correction and stocks ripped order of what would have happened in 2015. Um, but that's that's not what happened. We got about a four and a half percent correction and stocks ripped higher. Is that what you expected? No, actually, I, I wasn't surprised by the by the modest decline because Evergrande psychologically, Jared, is a million miles away from U.S. investors' minds. Um, you know, it, it's it's like a, a grizzly bear, you know, out in California when you're sitting on the 18th floor of a skyscraper in New York. It, it's interesting, but it's not relevant. And I think that between it being, you know, offshore, it being enormously complex, and then the, the issue of it being... You know, if it if it's an existential problem, we will gladly ignore that until we don't have to. And so, to which me, is what happened with COVID, which is exactly what happened with COVID. 
Yeah. And, and that's to me the, the potential parallel is that folks wake up one morning, you know, I don't know what the Tom Hanks or Rudy Gobert, you know, moment would be, but you know, the, the danger here is that we wake up one morning and the crisis has moved from being far offshore to being at the front door. And then people, yeah, and it gets, will, people will it goes from out. the back page of the newspaper to the front page of the newspaper on the top fold. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Talk uh, in your note, you went into some detail about how the covid situation played out and how we sort of came to grips with it psychologically over time. And talk, uh, you went into some detail on that. Talk about that in the parallels. Yeah, I, I've spent a lot of time going back and looking at sort of how we digested COVID. You know, I, I'm fascinated by decision making. And so, you know, what what was it that it enabled us to deny it? And what was so fascinating to watch was that you had this creeping approach. You know, COVID went from being in China to being in Europe to impacting U.S. multinationals like Apple and Starbucks. And yet we still said, you know, it doesn't impact us. It's still psychologically far away. And, you know, what what was so incredible to me was, you know, March 11th, you have this cascade as a function of two guys, you know, one an actor, one an athlete, who suddenly transformed this abstract threat into something that was real. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't take much for us to go from it's nothing to, oh, my God, it's something. And, and watching the progression with Evergrande, you know, we're, we're very happy to deny existential threats. And, and in fairness to investors, They've been paid an enormous amount of money to do just that in the last decade. I mean, that that whole notion that, you know, ignore political risk, ignore social risk. And, and you look at how much money people have made as a result. It's not surprising that we're ignoring it. Is there I mean, I call this denial and we, you know, we saw this in the financial crisis, too. I mean, from 2005 to 2007, it took a long time for that to play out. Um, is there a better word than denial? Do you have, is there something in your lexicon that describes this phenomenon? Yeah, I, I think it's in, in inherent to our DNA. You know, we, we have two, if you look at all of the choices we make, they fit into two buckets. Regain confidence when I've lost it and sustain confidence when I have it. And so, to me, this is this is nothing more than our attempt to sustain the confidence that we have. And so, you know, we don't we don't willingly make ourselves vulnerable. And that's that is what moving away from denial does is if, if we if we accept that this could be a real threat, we're we're essentially inviting vulnerability into the house. And so we, we hate to do that. So so we're we're really to me, we're we're just sustaining that sense of confidence because to do something otherwise doesn't you know, doesn't compute. Just makes us inherently uncomfortable. So maybe the way this plays out, and I'm just kind of spitballing here, but maybe you know over the course of the next two years, uh, Evergrande fails, something else fails, something else fails, and then it turns into contagion in China. China has a financial crisis. It has global implications, and then it, it spreads to the U.S. in 2023 or 24. I, I don't see that sort of time frame. I, I think given how primed we are for calamity these days and the experience we've had with COVID, um, I think we underappreciate the speed at which things could unfold. And, and beyond that, um, we are nowhere near as inherently confident today as we were in February 2020. So I, I, I think that while it would be lovely to think that we can play this out over months, if not years, I think that if some, something yells fire, this is a crowd that is already poised to panic, not wishing it, just looking at the, the behavioral setup. 
Interesting. So this morning, um, we got the news that China is banning all crypto transactions. Um, talk about um, crypto from a sentiment standpoint. Um, you know, I mean, everybody can look at the chart. It's kind of a head and shoulders top. There's kind of a bear flag. I'm not really a technician, but um, the sentiment seems to have been deteriorating for a while. Uh, we had, if you, I mean, we can talk in great detail about NFTs and, you know, the NFT market and the collectibles market and some of the prices that were being paid for NFTs and how that was a sentiment top. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So so cryptocurrencies and NFTs, I'm going to lump them together for a second because there's enormous abstraction to them. And so our embrace of those is something that only happens near an extreme in confidence. You know, we 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 love the the crazy, wild, potential futuristic um, kinds of financial opportunities only at the very top and, you know, throw SPACs into it as well. And so from a sentiment perspective, to me, the, the moment Elon Musk walked on stage for SNL, that was a, an enormous sentiment top related to a lot of the, the conjoined, um, highly abstract concepts, space, crypto, um, EVs. EV. I mean, there was, there was this, this futuristic climax that took place earlier this spring. And we've seen one big leg down. And to your point, we've had this second attempt at a new peak. And it doesn't feel the same. That There's no sense of momentum to it that I can find. Um, the crowd is thinning. And when I look at things like AMC and GameStop, I feel like the old guys are now trying to game the system too. You know, let, let's give investors free popcorn. So there's there's this deterioration in in momentum that is highly significant to me because manias need momentum. That's what that's what sustains the frenzy. And so I, I think the frenzy is gone in in all of these, in, including as you point out, NFTs. And it's not surprising then that you see increased regulation both in the U.S. and in in China. You know, one of the things that I count on the regulators to do is to close the barn door after the, the peak in sentiment. You know, they, we, regulators routinely pour water on a fire that was already going out. And, and I think that's exactly <laughs> the case here. And you remember, too, for China, um, the wealth disparity is so striking and so um, important in terms of social stability they have no choice but to pour more water on things that are very frothy. Now, I had you on my radio show a few months ago, my radio show, which has ended. Uh, you were my last guest. I think you were on the second to last night of the show. Um, and you used a term, I don't remember what it is, but you talked about how at peaks in sentiment, people are thinking about the future. And at lows in sentiment, people are thinking about the immediate surroundings around them. What what is what did you what did you talk about that? Yeah, so I call it horizon preference. That's right. Yeah, and and it's a it's a simple but overlooked aspect of of decision making, and that is when our confidence is low, meaning we feel intensely vulnerable. The only thing that matters is addressing the threat in front of us, and so that puts us in intense me here now mode. It becomes about me, not you. It becomes about right here in this moment and right now. So my my entire decision-making focus is immediate in every dimension. And, and the choices we make are, are absolutely concrete. If I go then to the other end of the spectrum, our, our ability to embrace abstraction is extreme. And so we're very generous. It becomes about us, not me. It becomes, um, in terms of horizon, this unlimited horizon into space, not surprisingly, in, as far as distance and as far as time, way out into the future. We, we extrapolate things you know, as far as the eye can see, and in turn, investors value them accordingly. And so earlier this year, there were 
all this incredible mosaic of us everywhere forever decision making. And what you've started to see is, is natural retrenchment from that. Um, we're becoming much more isolationist, much more conservative, um, you know, much, much less willing to embrace illusion. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that everybody thinks that, you know, Ben Platt is too old to play the role in Dear Evan Hansen. You know, we're we're becoming more suspicious of things um, that just don't feel quite right. Uh, I'm just I'm going to ask you directly. I mean, you seem pretty bearish, but I've known you for a long time and you're not always bearish. I think that's something that people, you know, get wrong about you is that you're like a perma bear. It's that's absolutely not the case. No, I mean, you go back. I, I have a, a whole video and presentation I did in the middle of March last year, which is, you know, all about why optimism will return. Why to be optimistic in the middle of that 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 meltdown? So, no, I I am not a, a perma bear by any stretch. Um, <laughs> you know, I I am looking for sentiment and opportunities in both directions. You know, I, 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 I piss off the bulls as much as I piss off the bear. Thing. <laughs> so um, I, I guess, I mean, you mentioned to me in a private conversation that you think that the market may have already peaked. And when I say peaked, I mean, you know, within a couple of percent or 5% or something like that, like not, not trying to top tick the market, but you know, it's, we're in the neighborhood of a top. Was there something sentiment wise? Was there one thing or was it an accumulation of things that made you believe that? So, you know, the, the, the things that stand out for me were the, the GameStop frenzy, you know, in, in late January, um, you know, that that was the culmination. Uh, you know, we've, we've had this variety of, of flash mobs with money, I call them. And, and GameStop was the flash mob of, of all flash mobs with money. You know, everybody who was going to play got in. And, and you saw coincidental behavior that, that confirmed that with things like out of the money, you know, weekly single stock options. You know, the, the, the climax in, in euphoria, I, I can track and measure in, in a variety of ways. And, and so I've looked at late January as the extraordinary moment in, in, in hubris and, and sentiment. And we've seen lesser peaks since. You know, I mentioned, you know, SNL and, and, and Elon Musk. We had AMC earlier this summer. You know, so, so you can see... To your point, it's it's not a moment; it's it's a it's a crest of a wave, and and one of the things that I always watch for is that the worst are the last to the party and the first to leave. So SPACs were significant to me because they're ridiculous as far as their underlying, you know, you know what what they're made up of, and and so it wasn't it was significant to me that they came late and then departed immediately thereafter. You know, the, the, the charts of SPACs are going to look like a big middle finger in history. Oh, man. You know, it was funny when the GameStop thing happened. Um, you know, I had the same sentiments. But uh, what I got wrong was, you know, I mean, a, a, top, a top in the stock market is not really a moment. It's a process, and it takes a long time. And right after the GameStop frenzy, I liquidated half the portfolio. I sold a bunch of tech. I said, this is the top. And, you know, it, the, the, the madness, you know, Dogecoin came after that. NFTs came after that. We've still had, you know, a bunch of crazy stuff that has happened since then. Yeah. And, and, but, but as you watch them up below the surface, there is this very subtle migration to more conservative choices. And, and so, you, as I said, the, the, the wildest, most outrageous alternatives show up at the last minute, and then you can watch them quickly reverse. Um, and and that, that spike in behavior is the indicator that the, the cycle is changing. You know, the, the subprime mortgages collapse first, then we went through Alt A, and then you could you could even see this cascading through the quality of organizations. You know, New Century, then Bear Stearns, then you know, 
ultimately you got you got to Lehman. Um, let's shift gears for a little bit. Um, and instead of talking about things where sentiment is hot, let's talk about things where sentiment is cold. You know, there's this chart that's been getting passed around Twitter for the last two or three years. And it shows the valuations, the relative valuations of stocks versus commodities going back, you know, 60 years or whatever. And you've had um, these peaks and troughs in stocks versus commodities. And, you know, the valuation of stocks versus commodities is at an extreme right now. Um, And, you know, just from a macro standpoint, we're entering a very inflationary period. Um, You know, if if you go into the 1970s, you had a lot of valuation compression in stocks. Stocks got very cheap and commodities got very expensive. Uh, What do you think about sentiment in commodities? What do you think about the next 10 years? So so let's let's talk about commodities and what we also call those, which is real assets. So. You know, when we start to talk about commodities, we're talking about things that are very tangible, which is at the opposite end of the spectrum from the abstraction of NFTs. So I don't think it's coincidence, Jared, that you have this peak in abstraction from an investment perspective coincident with a hatred, just this of of appeal for things that are real, that are tangible. And so I think what we're about to see, and we've started to see this, is a natural migration in terms of people's preference for things that are tangible. And that, to your point, is inherently inflationary because I'm going to buy things that I can hold, that I can eat, that I can consume in different ways because I feel like I need them. I'm, I'm afraid to be to be short of them. So one of the consequences is we're going from this era of extraordinary surplus to an environment of shortage, to an environment of scarcity. And nothing unnerves us more than scarcity. It's, you know, that that makes us vulnerable. And so we run the risk of, of hoarding begetting hoarding, inflation begetting inflation, that that we, that this that this behavioral change feeds upon itself. And and I think that coincident with this is what we're seeing at all levels of the supply chain. We've gone from just-in-time supply to just-in-case supply. So throughout the supply chain, people are hoarding critical inputs, worried about the supply of critical inputs, and in turn hoarding even more in response to that sense of scarcity. And and it's one thing if we do it one at a time, but we're all doing it together at the same time. You know, folks have, you know, pantries became this big build out in the during the pandemic because people knew that hey, I've experienced a shortage of toilet paper and sanitizer and wipes and PPE. I I'm going to make sure that I'm not short of the things that I need going forward. Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, people have very short memories. Um, I think that's the thing with sentiment guys is that we have very long memories and we can remember what the conditions were like even just a couple of years ago. I mean, back in 2019, if you went into a grocery store, all the shelves were full. And now people are becoming accustomed to the idea that you go into the grocery store and what you want may not be there. And if it is there, you're going to buy it all because it may not be there the next time. And, you know, one of the things we talked about before with an inflationary psychology, I mean, you know, you said that inflation is 100% psychology. It's not an economic phenomenon at all. It's 100% psychology. And so when people expect that goods will disappear or that the price will be even higher, they act in such a way that causes the price of goods to go even higher. They buy now, they buy as much as they can, and they hoard. And yeah. that's what we're experiencing. And and in in a whole range of, of products these days. And and I'll be honest with you, you know, the, the big box environments like like a Costco, which have inherently been structured with this flea market mindset of it's going to be here this week, but it may not be there next week, already sets in motion 
that 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 frenzy of I got to get it now. You know, I I knew as a Costco shopper that if I didn't if I didn't act, I ran the risk of it being gone in a month or you know six weeks. But now I'm now I'm afraid it may not be there. You know, next Tuesday when I go back. Uh, the inventory issue is really interesting. It's funny because I got an MBA in the late '90s, and so just in time inter- inventories was like a big thing. And just in time inter- inventories make a lot of sense in a deflationary environment because the value of your inventories is actually decreasing, uh, and it's a much more efficient way to do things. But you know, and there's a cost associated with having inventories. But in an inflationary environment, the the rationale for that totally changes because if you have more inventories, as prices are going up, you can the the you know the value is actually increasing, and it's you know it's wildly inefficient, and that's where we are today. Yeah, I mean, I I wrote a piece for the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago on the parallels between securitization and just in time supply chains because to me we did for stuff the same thing we did for loans and other financial assets you know we we created this highly interdependent conveyor system which moved things from one spot to another on the expectation that that conveyor belt would always be sustained and and flawlessly executed and you know in the financial crisis we had the fed to bail out the supply chain in essence, in loans, you know, they they provided the liquidity to the system when the conveyor system collapsed. We don't have that in the supply chain today. You know, there, there's no government that is capable of stepping in, um, or that would want to step in, because as these shortages develop, Jared, you're going to start to see countries recognize where they have competitive advantage, and become very nationalistic around those goods that they have, you know, potential control over. Um, and in, in the same way that we're seeing China act aggressively on, you know, who owns cryptocurrencies and who doesn't, I think we should expect governments to play a much more aggressive role in what goods come in and come out of, of harbors around the, around the globe. Uh, let's talk about ESG for a minute. Um, Great topic. You know, we found out recently that the Harvard Endowment is uh, getting rid of all fossil fuel investments. Um, I mean, there's a lot of energy bulls out there. And, um, you know, I have my thoughts on ESG, but I was interesting to see what you thought of it. Um, I mean, I think it's kind of a I think if it's kind of a trading rule that you have to bet against the Harvard Endowment. Um, But uh, (laughs) where do you think we're going with this? So I look at ESG as, again, one of those highly abstract, very generous phenomenons that only occurs at you know, peaks in sentiment. We are going to take on climate change. We're going to be proactive around this very abstract concept. History suggests that when sentiment turns down, we throw all of that sort of idealism away and become very practical around the consequences. You know, the, the Hoover Dam exists because we dealt with a, a real problem during the Great Depression. And so I think what we should expect is not ESG as it exists today, but a desire for remediation. How are we going to deal with, you know, the, the, the localized impact of, of higher levels of flooding? You know, what, what are we going to do in my community and your community to address the problems that are particular to us that we think we can solve? So I, I, I think remediation, repair, things that are very tangible to real problems is a it quickly replaces this this amorphous, highly idealized, futuristic approach to the environment. You know, the the thing with the thing I, I think about ESG is that it's kind of like luxury beliefs and we it it really speaks to the bull market and how wealthy we are as a society because we're willing to make this trade off. We're willing to trade off. Oh, you know, we don't need 300, 500 basis points in returns. We will accept lo- less money, lower returns in order to feel better about ourselves. Yeah. Right. 
And in in an environment like this, people are willing to make those trade-offs, and they haven't had to make those trade-offs because the performance of ESG has been good. But the question is, will they be willing to make those trade-offs when the performance disappears or if we have a bad, bad mar- a bear market? Yeah, and history suggests we won't. That 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 idealism, that generosity, that that noble ambition is tossed aside for what have you done for me lately? You know, I, I I've got a I've got a flood in the basement. Let's fix it. Uh, I want to talk about rates a little bit because that's kind of a big puzzle. Um, and sentiment in rates is a little bit tricky. You know, it's uh, it's a conundrum. I mean, we have negative four, negative five percent real yields. Um, you know, rates are backing up a little bit in the last couple of days. Um, but it's, it's hard for me to figure out sentiment in the rates market. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can, but right now things don't make a lot of sense to me. So rates to me made all sorts of sense in March. Um, because you had this coincidental enthusiasm, optimism around the vaccine, around stocks like Carnival Cruise Line, you know, the, the get back into the world stocks and interest rates. So there was this, this you know, return to normal excitement. And, and to me, those were coincidental indicators suggesting caution ahead, both in rates and in, in equities. What's been interesting to watch is that the, the decline since then in rates has been remarkably modest. So for all of the the deterioration in sentiment, you haven't seen much of a decline in rates. And and that to me is is worrisome because it it opens up the opportunity for rates to to move substantially higher. Um, And I I think that the question at the moment is what we've, you know, is what we've seen this week, the beginning of a more significant leg up as as inflation expectations become more permanent. I mean, you, you've seen, you know, pick up the Wall Street Journal today, you know, even Fed officials are acknowledging that inflation isn't transitory. And, and here, I, I want to highlight something, again, from history. I think it's useful to think of rates as a sentiment measure of our confidence in central bankers. If you go back to the early 1980s, we thought central bankers were incompetent, that they could do nothing to to address inflation and interest rates. And you you fast forward 30 years, 40 years, and we have this different mindset. There's no alternative. Central banks are now viewed to be omnipotent, and interest rates are extraordinarily low. And to your point, you know, real interest rates are are wildly low. And I and I think that that's potentially an important sentiment indicator, not just for interest rates, but how we feel about the power of central banks. And the the danger is that omnipotence is binary. You are either all powerful, or there is nothing behind the curtain. And I, and I don't think policymakers or investors fully appreciate the, the setup, that by, by providing this overwhelming force of QE, and particularly in response to the pandemic, we, we've, we've created an environment not of investor confidence, but of investor compliance. That, that what, we, what we have for investors today is, is more of a, of a prison than it is an excited, you know, highly optimistic environment of investing. And, and those, you know, prisons are inherently fragile. The guards either are overwhelming in their force or you end up with a prison riot. I read somewhere, this was many years ago, um, speaking to your point about omnipotence, that, you know, the central bank has many functions. One is monetary policy. One is to be a regulator, but the other one is to be an oracle. And, they have this oracular function, and I think what's I, I think what's setting up this question on omnipotence is the fact that you know the Fed is basically bet everything on the idea that inflation is transitory. Um, and you know one of the points I like to make about the Fed is that the Fed, 
you know, the Fed has a P&L, they make money, but that's not real. That's kind of incidental to what they do as an institution. What they what they really care about is losing face, you know, and it's it's going to be very difficult for the Fed to acknowledge that they were wrong about inflation being transitory. And I think that when they do acknowledge it, um, they'll reverse course very quickly and tighten very fast, which could be a problem. Yeah. And I, and I think to your point, you know, transitory is, again, one of those binary phenomena. It, it either is or it isn't. It's, it's contained in a, in a different, you know, in a different word. And so I, I agree with you that, that they run the risk of, of, you know, just like Evergrande not being contained, inflation not being transitory. And the, the consequences of, of that response will be um, rather frenetic repositioning, both by investors and the Fed. And what was striking to me this week was the dot plot out in, you know, 20, 2024, 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah. is there was no there was no clear view there was a an absolute absence of consensus and and that becomes a problem because to your point about being an oracle you know in the late 1990s you, you lived this as did i you had one oracle the only name that mattered was greenspan and and what we have today is more of a medusa you you have all of these Fed governors and, and you know, regional presidents and the, the voice is becoming um, disparate. And, and I think that that lack of cohesion is another indicator that we need to, to watch, because the only time you ever hear about regional Fed governors is when there's a challenge in the economy, when, when all of those opinions gain traction. And so I I. I think what you could end up with is a, a headless Fed where everybody has a view inside and out of, of what policymakers should be doing. That's pretty amazing. It, it's funny because there's a, there's an anonymous Twitter account out there, and I can't really it's, – it's kind of a crude name for Neil, Neil Kashkari. Um, it's funny, but, um, I, but I, after seeing that, I thought to myself, I'm like – People know who Neil Kashkari is. People know who Jim Bullard is. You know, when I, you know, when I started working at Lehman in 2001 and I did a lot of stuff with short term rates and I started following the Fed and I was following all the governors and the presidents. But I was like the only one in the trading floor who knew who these people were. Like you said, it was just all about Greenspan. Yeah. And, and so you have that intense concentration of power in one person which speaks to sentiment, you know, that the, the, those oracles and, and, you know, he was the oracle um, that that is a, a, a in and of itself, a, a statement on on sentiment. Uh, one last thing you mentioned, you know, we were talking about the late 1990s. Um, you know, that's really when I started investing. You know, I was very young. I was in my early 20s, but I was pretty dialed in. And, uh, and and I was aware that there was a bubble in tech. Of course, this was like 1998. And in 97, 98, I was buying value stocks because I thought, you know, I wasn't shorting anything, uh, but I was buying value stocks because I thought that tech was a bubble. And of course, um it continued for another two or three years, you know, which was painful for me. I mean, I was vindicated at the end, but also I, I missed out on a lot of returns. And, you know, the, when I, th when I think about sentiment, that was the late 1990s were like the toughest time um, to be trading sentiment be because like it just went on forever. You know, it went on forever. And I don't know, I don't know what you were doing in 1997 or 1998, but I would have loved to have, heard your thoughts back then. So I, I actually was good friends with the guys at Oakmark, um, you know, big value house. They had been big investors in First USA, a company I'd, I'd worked for. And, you know, they, they were getting death threats. Um, you know, <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, they, they were, you know, that the things that were being said to them, you know, were just horrific. And, you know, as the market just kept going, you know, ultimately many of them resigned 
you know, just they, they were burnt out. They had had enough, you know, that, that it just didn't, none of it made sense to them. And, and I, and, you know, along the way, we've seen similar value capitulations, you know, big value investors saying I'm, I'm out um, or, or they're just simply discredited by the crowd. But, you know, in the same way in the late 1990s, we've had this phenomenon where the novice and naive show up. You know, we, we call them day traders in the late 1990s. Today, they're the, you know, the, the you know, choose, choose the acronym HODL, you know, whatever, you know, the, the guys who are trading GameStop, the Reddit crowd, it's, it's the same sentiment indicator in, in, a, in a more modernized package. And so I think that what, what I've been waiting for and, and the, the challenge with these is they, they do go on longer than you ever anticipate is, is exhaustion. You know, that the, the last person who's going to invest finally shows up and puts money down. And I, and I think in many ways we saw that beginning in January in, in stocks and we've seen it flow through to the other, the other you know, heavily retailed investment strategies, including, to your point, collectibles and, you know, trading cards and athletic shoes and, you know, just, just choose the, the thing that could be financialized. Great. Well, Peter, it's been, uh, it's been great talking to you and uh, thanks for coming on my show uh, right before it ended. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. So, uh, I always enjoy is, the conversation, Jared. It's lots yeah, of Yeah, this is, uh, this is super educational and um, I get so much out of whenever I talk to you. So thanks for coming on and I'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much.